Thank you. 
good afternoon once again. Uh, we have something a little bit different to offer today, although in the same, along the same lines. I'm very uh, pleased to introduce the guest, uh, my friend and close colleague, Michael Morrison, an emeritus professor at Swarthmore College and uh, a well-known Bach scholar. Uh, if you are interested in reading about new and interesting ideas about Bach, uh, his essay collections, Bach and God, and Bach Against Modernity are highly to be recommended. He's also written about Brandenburg concertos, about the curious theology of Handel's Messiah, and all kinds of other interesting <laughs> topics. Uh, we've worked together for many years on various projects, including one that you have run across here, and that is the ongoing project of translating the text of J.S. Bach's vocal works at bachcantatatext.org. And uh, it is our work together that, that you see and have seen in program for the last three or four years. And I commend that site to you. You can reach it, among other ways, uh, by the link and QR code that we put in the program uh, each time. If you're really interested and want to keep up with the text that we add every couple of weeks or so, um, there's a sign up for uh, an email list. And we also post announcements to Facebook. Uh, so Michael and I thought that we would join forces, uh, as we have uh, on some other occasions, to talk about this uh, extraordinary piece. We have a whole bunch of topics. I'm not sure how many of them we're actually going to get through. <laughs> when we get going, we, we yeah. uh, not, not to be able to stop. Um, so we'll, we'll try to keep this to a reasonable time and have a chance to hear this spectacular piece again. So we thought we might talk uh, about a few of the movements uh, in the piece. And it's hard not to start with the opening astounding opening movement. This is, of course, a cantata from Bach's second annual cycle that he composed in Leipzig, meaning that uh, its text is drawn from all the stanzas of a uh, seasonally or thematically appropriate hymn. He'll he is, his librettist presents him with the text intact of the first and last stanzas, which become the first and last movement, drawing on the hymn tune. And then everything in between paraphrases into recitative and aria poetry the content of the other stanzas, taking into account some other things as well that we'll talk about. This extraordinary uh, opening movement is uh, many different kinds of pieces at once. As you heard, calling for the entire ensemble, it opens with instrumental material that is uh, self-contained and musically closed. Uh, it turns out to be the so-called Ritornello, the recurring instrumental passage of what amounts to a concerto. And that will come back at the beginning and end, and in various keys, that is at various pitch levels, through the course of the piece, what comes in between Ritornello's, what would be the solo of a solo concerto, is a setting of this uh, chorale tune, Jesu del du Meine Seele. So this is a concerto and is a chorale setting. Um, as a chorale setting, it's a pretty extraordinary thing. It reaches way back into Lutheran music history uh, for a kind of chorale setting that has each of the three lower voices enter with material uh, based on, enter in one by one on material based on the tune, all culminating in the en entry of the soprano, doubled here by transverse flute and horn, played both so beautifully, uh, with a, the chorale tune in slow motion. It is thus a chorale motet with a cantus firmus as well. I could go on, it's many other things as well. It's rhythmic and metrical organization it is the slow dance known as a sarabande. Um, it is an ostinato piece. It has the same musical phrase that appears over and over and over again, mostly in the bass line, but sometimes above. And that ostinato line is itself a famous tune, it's a descending so-called chromatic scale, scale da, 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 which you might know from Dido's Lament in Purcell's Dido and Aeneas. It is the so-called lamento bass. So it's a concerto, and it's a sarabande, and it's a Candus Firmus motet, and it's an ostinato all at once. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> in fact, what about I would almost describe it as it has everything, including two kitchen sinks. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I would just, I'll just talk briefly about uh, what the implications of some of those things are in the opening movement. Uh, it happens to be quite timely. Uh, uh, what I would say is that the, the central part of what's going on musically in the opening movement, you could describe as a sonic equivalent of what you see up there. You see a cross with a purple, what do you call that thing that's draped over it? Whatever they do, whatever you call that thing. <laughs> draping. <laughs> purple, purple draping. Well, where that comes from is the idea that, you know what the cross is, of course, but the purple draping has to do with the way Jesus is depicted in the canonical Gospels 
He is, uh, has a purple cloak placed upon him by the Roman soldiers who make fun of him as if he's, oh, so you're a so-called king. But the purpleness has to do with the, the reason he's wearing a purple cloak, they happen to have one on hand, I guess, in the, in the story. Uh, the purple is an extremely expensive color in the ancient world, and only royalty could afford to wear it. So that's why, in order to make fun of him as a king, he wears the purple cloak and the crown of thorns. And so it's a, uh, that's, that's the idea with the visual. So how does that come out in the music here then? Well, the, the lament bass that Dan was describing is sort of the equivalent of the cross that you see up there. But the sarabande is a very, very difficult French court dance. And so I just, I won't dilate too long on this, but in Leipzig, it became very popular in Bach's day for, uh, the, it's, a, it's a merchant city. And the merchants, they want to have a really nice church with a big organ and a good choir. So that when people from other cities come to Leipzig, well, you know, Leipzig looks good, both spiritually and musically and aesthetically and politically and so on and so forth. And one of the ways that people sort of raised their being and social status was to take dancing lessons. And the steps of a minuet, for example, or a bourre are relatively easy to learn. So those are the ones that you'll learn first. And the hardest one to learn is the cerebon. That really separates the men from the boys and the women from the girls, I guess, and others. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the idea then is that because it's such a difficult dance and it's such a high court French dance, it sort of acts in this piece then as the equivalent of the royalty that we see up there. So that lament and victory and, and, uh, and regalness are sort of all completely mixed up and tied up uh, with each other. So the only last thing I'll say about that is that um, it may not be obvious what it is that they're lamenting. Uh, often in music history classes, you're taught that, oh, they're lamenting the death of Jesus. And that seems quite a reasonable thing to think. But that's not the way Lutheran theology thought of it in Bach's day. The idea is that you're not having compassion for Jesus because he's suffering. Is it so bad? Oh, I feel bad that he's suffering so badly. The idea is that you feel bad because he had to suffer because of your sin. You're, you're lamenting your sin. You're not lament lamenting his being on the cross. And that's a very important distinction for um, Lutheran theologians in Bach's day. We only talk historically, we're not, I know we're in a church and everything, but we're not here to preach what's true or untrue, we're just trying to explain what's going on in the, in the feast. Okay, good. Um, and then, um, I think after having talked about, having heard and talked about that first movement, um, it's natural to go next to the movement that follows it, which could not be a bigger musical contrast. That's the soprano uh, alto duet. Um, that is a particular kind of aria that doesn't involve any other instruments, and we'll come back to that topic, with the extraordinary uh, uh, bass line um, that is shadowed, the bass line played in the cello, that's then shadowed by a uh, plucked uh, double bass, plucked violone, an extraordinary thing. Um, it's uh, entirely contrasting its major mode as opposed to minor mode, it's in a duple meter as opposed to a uh, triple meter, it's fast rather than slow. Um, Everything about that, almost everything about that first movement is French um, in its invocation of the Sarabande, in its combination of the Sarabande and the Lament, which makes it a tombeau, a kind of memorial, a kind of memorial piece um, as well. Bach even imitates some of the really interesting and characteristic textures of uh, French ostinato piece writing, especially textures you can listen for in which the bass instruments drop out and it's just the oboes and the upper strings playing. Everything about that is French, although there are two moments where Bach invokes Italian and phrasing. It's a very startling, it's a very startling moment. But almost everything about the duet that follows um, is Italian, right? And it, you could even compare it to uh, duets that were well known to Bach and to Handel uh, by Agostino Stefani, for example. So a complete musical uh, contrast uh, that follow in the duet that follows this amazing chorus. <coughs> There are some interesting things, though, about why Bach would make this contrast and what he's actually getting at in this, in this piece. Right, indeed. In fact, one, one extra musical element that I would add is that the, not only is it major versus minor and so on, but also that the, the first one with the fall, is the falling chromatic bass line that slides half step by half step down to the fifth note of the scale. This one 
does the exact opposite. It, climb, it climbs up step by step, non, so-called non-chromatically. It just follows the notes that are actually in the scale. It climbs from a B flat up to an F, where the other one went from a, a G, G down to a D. So it's, it's, it's actually in the opposite direction, and it's not chromatic, but so-called diatonic for the music theory nerds in the, in the, in the uh, audience here. Um, okay, so um, the other thing that's striking about this duet is that um, it has very little language from the hymn in it. Remember that Dan had said that the way a chorale cantata works is that the opening and closing movements are verbatim and the inner movements are written as modern poetry that take the ideas from those old, uh, older uh, hymn, hymns. And when, one general thing I wanted to throw in about that too is that as translators we are finding the most difficult things to translate are the chorale stanzas. They're, they're <coughs> crazy expressions like, remember that Stephen Colbert book that was entitled, um, I am America and so can you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there are a lot of sort of constructions that are like that. And those would have been confusing to people even in box there. And so I think part of the idea behind the whole cycle of chorale cantatas for the whole year was um, to sort of bring them up to date, as it were, for the congregation so they would have a better idea what they were actually, what they actually meant. And uh, probably, we don't know what the sermons were for those occasions, because all the sermons are lost that were delivered in the Nicholas Church and the Thomas Church, but quite likely the sermons focused very heavily on the content of the hymn, uh, as well as a, as a way of getting, of digging even deeper into the, into the Bible. Yeah. Uh, and this particular movement uh, hardly draws on the words of the chorale stanza that it nominally lines up with. Uh, the only image it takes uh, over is uh, this idea of being lost, and because it uh, refers to um, uh, that you you seek the ailing and uh, faithfully, and there's a reference in that chorale stanza to the, the errant errant sheep. Instead, this makes a whole series of references uh, to the gospel text that was read on, on that day. That's right, a very, very strange story, actually, that's only in the Gospel of Luke. It has Jesus going with the disciples through Samaria and Galilee, and they're going to Jerusalem, and they see there's these ten lepers. That's why the leprosy of sin stuff and stuff is, is in there, and these ten lepers cry out to him, Meister, in the German term, Master, Will you please heal us? And he says, "Well, go to the priest, and uh, you know, they'll, you know and, and they all they turn out to all be healed." Here's the sort of funky part at the end of the story that is sort of uncomfortable from a modern perspective. It says that only one of them sort of thanked Jesus for healing them, and they make a really big deal about the fact that the one who thanked Jesus for healing them was a, he was a Samaritan. You know, a Samaritan. It's like, well, that was really bad. It was considered really bad to be a Samaritan by people who weren't Samaritan in the, in, the, uh, in the first century. And Luther was very, very, very excited about this. He's Luther got, always got very excited any time the Bible seemed to be talking about the God of Israel being extended to the Gentiles. And Luther thought that the Samaritans were Gentiles. They weren't actually, but... And the idea was that he thought they were Gentiles who worshipped the God of Israel and, in addition, had Roman gods. And that's what made them different from the, from the Israelites. But, they were, but this Samaritan is very special, he's sort of a proto-Gentile, proto proto-Lutheran is, is the idea, so that's why he loved this story. Yeah, and it says that they, at the end, Jesus says to this one, I uh, who, uh, who does thank him, he says, go, um, it's, it's your belief, your faith that has healed you. And if you want to know, there's always the question in the air, why did Bach's librettist and Bach choose a particular chorale to go with a, uh, on a particular day. If it's Advent or Christmas, you pick an Advent hymn or a Christmas hymn or Easter, you pick an Easter hymn. Almost all the other connections are thematic. And if you look at the very last stanza, the one sung as a simple chorale, it begins, Herr, ich glaube, hilf mir Bach. And that's the culmination here. Uh, it's one of Luther's most important theological points, is that it's faith that is responsible for so much of, of um, what a human being can, can achieve, and particularly from Jesus' presence on earth and death. And it's that last stanza and its uh, emphasis on belief, in fact, that are uh, most important uh, here. And so um, this uh, duet text um, 
draws on any number of words and phrases that appear uh, in that uh, story. Achhöre, um, achhiras, this is, this is what in Luther's translation, the 10 lepers say from the side um, of, the, of the road. Um, o Meister, they, they say. And there's a really interesting translation issue that we, that we might talk about here. You better do it now, because I feel like the clock is probably ticking you already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I tell you, we're all going to get there every time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here's a fun thing. You know, you were taught in elementary school that commas matter, right? Remember that? They said the, the, the classic sentence was, let's eat, Grandma. <laughs> 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 better have a comma after eat, right? <laughs> right. Well, there's something weird like that going on in this but you have to actually know the background, and most of our colleagues, uh, I don't want to trash our colleagues particularly, but <laughs> they didn't know what the background to this, to this uh, was. And so when, an addition, when additions were made of this piece, and probably the ones that the folks are using tonight, if you, you look at it, it will say, O Meister, comma, zu helfen zu dir. This is in the second line of the German text, number two. So, O Meister, comma, zu helfen zu dir. But what it actually says, there were no, and in the original part that the uh, singer said to use, it's a total mess, it's really hard to read, and there's no commas or periods or anything, because Bach wrote the stuff out very quickly, and the idea was it wasn't for posterity that that thing was made, it was for the singer to use on Sunday, and to, to put the minimum info in there, they're supposed to understand what's going on, so they sing it in a way that sort of brings that out, presumably. But anyway, the idea here is that it's supposed to say, not all Meister comma zu helfen dir, but all Meister zu helfen, comma, zu dir. And Meister zu helfen, that's, those three words are, it's, it, are a technical term in Lutheran theology from the 17th century. It borrows, it's borrowed from a bizarre story in Isaiah 63, in which the blood-stained warrior who rescues the Israelites from the Edomites uh, is uh, is referred to as a as uh, forget what the original Hebrew is, but it says something about delivering the Israelites from those enemies. And Luther idiosyncratically translated that as a meister zu helfen. And there were no words for salvation in those days because they didn't believe in an afterlife at that point yet. So you didn't need a so all the terms that are used to refer to the fact that you might have a blessed afterlife are things like. Ransom, deliver, rescue, help, and so on. So Meister zu helfen was a master at salvation. And so these naive, this wonderful naivete of the two of the soprano and alto singing together, they're not praying, hey God, help me out, I'm not, I'm not feeling well, you know, in They're praying for salvation, for a blessed afterlife. So it's actually, in, in that sense, the naivete of it is interesting, but it's a serious request, it's, the, it's about something very serious. Yeah, and if, and if, and the, the presence or absence of that comma uh, makes the difference. And in fact, if you're interested, we had a blank page, so we filled it oh, yeah. um, with a reproduction of a document that turned up only relatively recently. This is the title page and a couple of pages from the uh, little booklet, and they really are only about uh, this big, that you could purchase outside the church if you wanted, that contained the texts of usually about six of the church cantatas to be formed performed at St. Thomas or St. Nicholas or sometimes both. And this one turned up a few years ago, and if you look at that line, sure enough, there's no comma. <laughs> o Jesu, O Meister zu helfen, zu dir. And so it turns out that this is not only uh, a little bit of punctuation along, uh, you know, for pedantic reasons, it makes an enormous difference in understanding what this extraordinary movement um, is about. Uh, let's say a couple of words about um, the two other uh, arias here. Uh, the sixth movement, the bass aria, is very clearly an operatic rage aria, and a, a very particular kind, a so-called revenge aria, and you'll hear the, the bass sing that very word. Uh, my, uh, it will quiet my conscience with cries for vengeance, <laughs> cries out for vengeance. And you could hear many of the musical devices that uh, go along with a conventional 18th century depiction of rage and revenge. If that aria reminded you of music by Handel, it's no accident, because Handel's serious operas are full of this very kind of piece. But I have to ask, what is the purpose of all this anger? What is this actually about? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I really thought that through. <laughs> um, I'll come into it maybe by saying, though, that uh, 
I, you know, there are about 200 church cantatas of Bach that survive, and I didn't systematically look through them all on this. I should have before I came here. But I don't, as far as I can remember, there's no other church cantata of Bach's or any vocal work of Bach in which you climb down the vocal range as you work your way left to right through the score. You know, so we have the we have the choir on the outer movements, but then there's a duet, the naive duet for soprano and uh, alto at the beginning, and then it's the very first thing where they go, you know, this fantastic ah <laughs> out of the out of the tenor with sort of a Q flat minor <laughs> chord. You know, it's, it's suddenly you know it's a little bit less naive, and the voice is a little deeper, you know, and so on and so forth. And and, and he, has, he, has, he has his wonderful aria with the flute and so on. But then things really get literally profound. When the bass comes in, you know, everything's lower, and the text not only is everything getting lower as we go left to right to the cantata, but also the texture is becoming, it started out thin, it's getting thicker and thicker as you move from. So everything about what's going on is becoming more profound, is the, is the, um, is, is the, is the way that, is the way that I hear it. And I think that's related to, I'm not trying to, like, I'm not a politician trying to avoid the question here, but maybe we'll somehow come around to it. <laughs> but but the, uh, what's related to that is a um, very important understanding of what the heart is in pre-modern thinking, too, because there's a lot of talk about the heart in this thing. And in modern readers think, oh, yeah, my heart, you know, Jesus loves me in my heart, and I love him in his heart. And they think it's like a love, it's just a love thing, it's just an emotion. But for, uh, for Bach and his audience, the heart was the seat both of the emotions and the intellect. And not only was it the seat of the emotions and the intellect, but it was the place where Jesus literally lives. Literally, not metaphorically. You take communion, you know, the bread and wine is transformed literally into the physical body and blood of Jesus and is believed to sort of reside in your heart. And there are these fantastic liturgical books from Bach's day with all these... Uh, paintings and pictures, and they show Jesus inside the believer's heart with a broom going to clean it up. <laughs> <laughs> so then, it's, you know, he wants a nice, it's, it's kind of like a studio apartment, but he wants it to be clean. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there are others where it's, he's singing in the heart, or, you know, there's all these Jesus in the heart things, and they, you know, they really mess, and, and that's what this, and the, the fantastic, the best aria ever on this subject, of course, is in the Matthew passage. Mache dich mein Herz rein. Make, make your heart pure. Why? So that Jesus can live in there. That's the idea. Because if it's impure, if it's got the leprosy of sin, let's talk about the beginning, then he can't, he can't live there, is the, is, the, uh, is the idea. So maybe it's some of the, 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 the strong emotion of feelings around, you know, that my conscience wants vengeance with me for being a sinner, that sort of the, the intensity of that has to do with taking extremely seriously this business of uh, whether um, your, uh, your heart is really uh, properly set up for uh, Jesus to be in it. And the only way that that will happen, of course, is through the, this health and high and uh, all those salvific metaphors that we're talking about. If you are uh, given the unmerited gift of faith, then uh, everything will fall into place properly is the, is the idea. But certainly the cantata doesn't want you to think that that process is easy. It is a process, and part of think that process is is this is this deepness and thickness that uh, that uh, tried to hopefully coherently uh, describe. Good. And then just another minute till we have to say a couple of words about the middle aria. The arias make a kind of progression from an aria with just basso continuo to one with just a solo instrument with the voice to a full ensemble. It's that middle one that blut so meine Schuld durchstreicht, a very odd text. The blood, Jesus' blood, which which uh, strikes out my death, makes my heart light again. Um, and but then um, a little bit later in the text, you see that this turns to a military metaphor of, of struggle and victory. And there's a couple of really interesting points about what these two very differently different kinds of metaphors are doing in, in the same number. Can you say something about that? Uh, well, yes, yeah, something surprising. It made it, it actually links, of course, <laughs> with what we were just talking about. Which is that uh, one extremely cool thing that I forgot to say, and this is a good opportunity to say it now because it's related to that, is the last four lines of the recitative of the bass, which gets very lyrical all of a sudden. You feel there's that bold type face there, and you wonder why is the bold face there? I don't know if you remember why. You know, the Roman type is, is the modern poetry, but the bold face type is the, is the hymn. 
So he, he's actually singing the hymn text at that point with this very flowery kind of uh, melody. But if you were to sort of like take every fourth note of that, it turns out it's the pitches of the last few lines of the hymn. And you really have to really, I mean, I, I'm sure there are singers who have sung, I'm not going to cast aspersions on her. There are probably some singers who have sung it many, many times before they realized for the first time that they were actually singing the last line of the hymn. And that's how brilliantly the, 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 the melody is set out. But the idea here is, uh, I think, is that the, the modern recitatives and arias are sort of about the Christian in the present, so to speak. But the thing, what the hymns do, the hymns link you with what the, what the church called the community of saints. All Christians of the past and the present and the future are, see, are sort of eternally experienced as a now by God himself, right. is the idea. So what this base has done has, is literally sort of acclimated himself to entering the community of, the community of saints. That's, what, that's the way I make sense out of this amazing, <coughs> totally amazing uh, end yeah. of the and aria. And you may have noticed that something similar looks as if it happens at the end of the recitative number three for tenor, that ends with a couple of lines quoted directly from yeah. He's the not hand. ready, he's not ready. Right? <laughs> but Bach there does not turn to the chorale melody. Um, uh, and he uses a really interesting, uh, this, is a, this is an anguished recitative, full of uh, self-accusation. And then at the end, it, it ends with a plea. It says, um, uh, Lord, uh, please do not reckon the, my misdeeds that have so angered you, an anticipation of the mutual anger that's apparently there that we were talking about before. Um, do not uh, reckon the misdeeds. Now, to reckon uh, has, means a couple of different things. It can mean uh, to... Um, to pass a judgment, a legal judgment. Um, but it can also mean, mean reckon in an accounting sense. And those ideas, and you can read them both ways, are picked up in the aria that follows. Yes, that crazy stuff about the blut durchstreicht, the, the blood strikes out. The idea is that the, the ink, in God has an account book with their reckoning of sins, good things you did and bad things that you did. And what God is going to do is take Jesus' blood, make that be the ink, and cross out the leprosy of sin parts in the account book. That's what the idea with that. So that's one use of uh, blood, I think. But then later, it actually says that, that when the base comes out, he says that you take the blood and sprinkle it on your heart. And what? <laughs> Are you sprinkling the ink now that we were talking about before? This is actually a different blood metaphor, but they're both self-indic is the idea. The other one is also that there's a one strange story in the Hebrew Bible about uh, Moses sprinkling, the, making a sacrifice, and then sprinkling the blood on the people so that it gets on their, their face and stuff. You know, very, very strange story. And that is what's uh, understood as a blessing upon the people. So this is a, a reflection of that idea. Uh, so they, they, if we said with the opening movement, they threw every kind of musical thing you could possibly throw at into the court. They throw every possible theological and biblical idea. If you can get it in there, work it in. Do we have time for one more thing about the Angonomic site or no? Sure. It's on this type Yeah, yeah, because uh, sometimes people will tell us, you know, we get like, uh, you know, kind of semi obnoxious email notes on our uh, you didn't translate that line right. <laughs> in the opening, it's, you know, it says that, yes, it's the angenehme site. Now is the pleasant time. That's very strange. First, an angenehme is fault. Yeah, this is the last two lines of the opening movement. Right, so you see we have this fancy word there. You know, and we've made to know this through your propitious word. And they say, that can't be right. That's not what angenehme means. It is, though. <laughs> because if you know your, if you know your original I, I wish I'd add that in... Modern German angenehm means pleasant. Yeah. So angenehm is better heute. But those, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's, it's exactly what they would say, yeah. Uh, and, but what's interesting is that this is a very famous passage in the in Second uh, Corinthians, in which it says, uh, uh, Now is the of the Eupodectos Kairos. Those are the two words that are in Kairos, the, the word time. You can't even capture that in English. Kairos time, there are two kinds of, oh, there are various kinds of time, but the two essential ones are another. So called Kronos time and Kairos time. And Kronos time is just your clock ticking, like some of you are probably thinking it's 
clicking. <laughs> right. And that's, that's Kronos time. And Kairos time has to do with what it emotionally feels like. Something could be actually a short amount of Kronos time, but feel like a long time Kairos-wise, and vice versa, and there are various um, things about that. So the idea here is that in Corinthians it says, now is the acceptable or propitious, now is a really important emotional Kairos time for salvation to take place. And that's why what looks like this horrible thing, this guy bleeding on the cross and so on, is in fact a wonderful victory because now is the time. That's the idea. Yeah. So there is, um, we do a lot of explaining of this in the elaborate footnotes. Uh, on the online uh, version of this, we commend you to bakatatatext.org. We could go on because there's more in this piece, but you will be glad to hear that at this point we will thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>